In this video, I am going to talk about the characters in John Dryden's All for Love. Characters in Antony and Cleopatra are individuals. They represent all human kinds. Whereas the characters in Dryden's play are types. They represent certain qualities no more no less. To have more details, we are face to face with two kinds of characters. The first kind is individual. Shakespeare's moments of hesitation are due to the misjudgment and they are related to all human beings. He presents certain human qualities that relate to all humankind, such as ambition, ambiguity, hesitation, misjudgments, and much more. All for love is a different case. It presents types, in the sense that each character represents a type that may not be applied to everyone. To exemplify the case, Octavia is a deserted wife. Cleopatra is a mistress. Antony is a man torn between love and duty. Ventidius represents the loyal friend. So, each character represents a type of a different kind. Moreover, Antony's children stand for the family affairs, the family duties so to speak. Alexis stands for reason. He is a reasonable character all the time. Serapion is a priest. So, he stands for priesthood. All these characters are destroyed by passion, their passion for sure. For example, Ventidius is destroyed by the very end by his passion to Antony. He represents loyalty, in addition to the depth of relationship. He is willing to die with Antony, and so he does. Antony is also destroyed by his passion, particularly by his love to Cleopatra. As every reader knows, he sacrifices the offer of reconciliation. Cleopatra is the same. She sacrifices the kingdom for love at the end. The destructiveness of passion could be one main issue in Dryden's play. Passion is quite idealized here. The rest of the characters namely, Iris and Charmian commit suicide. They are attached to the queen even in death. Now. Individuals are larger than types, for types are social. You get types in Shakespeare's plays, but we do not get individuals in Dryden's. Types represent certain qualities, a loyal friend, a deserted wife, a man torn between love and duty. Etc. They do double actions, they heighten the value of love and exaggerate it at the same time. This is a neoclassical method of portraying the character. It got to textualize the writer. Shakespeare belongs to his age, and Dryden belongs to Restoration Age which was the Neoclassical Age. This kind of character portrayal is one of the characteristics of the Neoclassical Age. Characters in All for Love are simplified and idealized. Antony here is oversimplified, he is not like Shakespeare's Antony who is enlarged and given these large images. He is just a lover, yet this love is idealized by Dryden. Now. Characters in Dryden or in the neoclassical way of portrayal are idealized. Because of the influence of the French neoclassicism, the character gets limited number of characteristics. This love is idealized, heightened, and exaggerated. Ventidius is a loyal friend, and he is narrowed and cut down just to take the place to a loyal friend. He is really willing to die for the sake of Antony. Thus, this loyalty destroyed him. This kind of loyalty is exaggerated. Notice that the psychology of the character is lacked here, in the neoclassical method. In other words, there is no depth any longer. Again, this is connected to the idea of simplification. So, we do not see or have this kind of character just like Hamlet, who allows us to penetrate into his interior mind, or psychology. It is not as deep as Shakespeare's character. Antony here is described in the prologue. All what we know about him is that weak character, hopeless, moaning, crying and weeping. Unsuccessfully, he is reduced to this kind of character, just to this declined degree. Therefore, we are allowed to see him only from this corner. In the prologue, especially, on page 17, Antony is described to us, he is somewhat lewd, but a well-meaning mind weeps much, fights little, but is wondrous kind. When the man is lewd, he got this sexual desire. Notice the description, weeps much, fights little. Actually, 
we see him in the first act doing these. He excluded himself from the society. This is because it is introduced to us immediately after know the battle of Actium. He is quite down, yet we are introduced to his past glory. Another description of Antony is on page 21, a description of how he was great. This is how he is introduced in the play. Serapion says, Serapion. Tis strange that Antony, for some days past, has not beheld the face of Cleopatra, but here, in Isis' temple, lives retired, and makes his heart a prey to black despair. The hero has locked himself in the temple of Isis, suffering despair, and moaning and complaining, this can be compared to Antony of Antony and Cleopatra. Our first meeting with Antony, we see him in high spirits enjoying his life, and enjoying his love affair. In the same page Serapion says, if he be vanquished, or make his peace, Egypt is doomed to be a Roman province, and our plenteous harvests must then redeem the scarceness of their soil. If he makes peace, Egypt will be a part of the Roman Empire. While Antony stood firm, our Alexandria rivaled proud Rome but if he stood firm, if he is strong, then our Alexandria will be a rival to Rome. This is the introduced Antony, the weak person. Yet his past glory is narrated. This is a gentleman who is sent by Antony. Gentleman says, he eats not, drinks not, sleeps not, has no use of anything, but thought. So, Antony does not eat or sleep, or even drink, but he is only thinking. There is a description of Antony, cursing, talking to himself and sitting alone doing nothing but defying the world around. On page 25. There is an idealization about him when Ventidius, does the mute sacrifice upbraid the priest? He knows him not his executioner. Oh, she has decked his ruin with her love. It is an idealization of love, and an idealization of the subject matter which is very typical of the heroic tragedy. In the heroic tragedy, we have idealized characters, and so for the subject matters. Oh, she has decked his ruin with her love led him in golden bands to gaudy slaughter, and made perdition pleasing. She has left him the blank of what he was. Cleopatra has endangered him. He was great, however, she had emptied him from his greatness. Cleopatra deprived him of his manhood, of his greatness, and of his past. Can any Roman see, and know him now, thus altered from the lord of half mankind, this is related to the destructiveness of his love. So, if any Roman can see him now, and see how altered or changed from the lord of half mankind. He was so strong, so complete and so perfect, but now he is reduced into a woman's toy. Shrunk from the vast extent of all his honours, and cramped within a corner of the world? O oh Antony! Thou bravest soldier, and thou best of friends. In other words, you were the best friend and the best soldier. Dryden is actually using the same of Shakespeare's description of Antony. Shakespeare's Antony was a great soldier, the best great friend. He was generous. Antony was rough in the war, but merciful after it. Then all their praying virgins left at home. A description of his love is emphasized. He is simplified from what he was to what he is now. Compared to Shakespeare's Antony who is great, was still great and we see him taking decisions and commanding. Etc. On the other hand, here, he is just a little corner enjoying his idealized love. On page 34, there is again an idealization of Antony's character, depending on the classical tradition. Ventidius says, no prince but you could merit that sincerity I used. There is a sort of emphasis on the destructiveness of love, of passion. And of course, his love to Cleopatra is heightened, and there is always this conflict between love and duty in him. Love is taking the stronger position, and the stronger hold. On page 35, when Ventidius talks badly about Cleopatra, Antony says, Prithee, do not curse her, and I will leave her. His love actually makes us sympathize with him, but it is also at the same time it is related to sentimentality. Antony cries, Oh, Cleopatra. Such an idealization makes us sympathize with this character. 
Antony and so Dryden's sacred love, in the way he cries, and in the way he talks to her just like a little boy. On page 44, he expresses physical love, as well as spiritual one. On page 44, Cleopatra sends him a bracelet to take, but Ventidius asks him not to take it. Antony says, Nay, now you grow too cynical. This is an expression of physical love. She sends him a bracelet because he was going away. Aso, every little jewelry, every bead of this bracelet will remind him of her embraces, of her hot kisses. A melting kiss at such and such a time, and now and then the fury of her love, when, and what harms in this. Of course, this evokes the physical love of Antony. And at the same time, there is a spiritual side of it. This is on page 47. Antony is talking to her expressing a spiritual love. Antony says, Again you break your promise. I loved you still, and took your weak excuses, took you into my bosom, stained by Caesar, and not half mine, I went to Egypt with you, and hid me from the business of the world, shut out the inquiring nations from my sight, to give whole years to you. So, I just threw away the whole empire and nation from my sight, to give myself entirely to you. This is all for love which is a symbol of the neoclassical technique in literature. This is the end of the video, please, do not forget to click the notification bell, like, share and subscribe my channel.